Have you ever been part of a team where everything just seemed to work so well and people meshed well together? It was basically an effective, successful team. Or maybe, have you been part of a team where it was the opposite? Things really don't work very well, there's a lot of conflict going on, and basically the team is unable to achieve the results that it needs to achieve. Well, to try and explain some of these things, we are going to be talking about team models, team development models and team effectiveness models. So let's get started. Hi there, folks. I'm Petula, your host here at All Things Agile. So on the topic of today, the nature of teamwork and successful and effective teams is so not obvious. However, there are models that try and explain how things could happen positively. Now, models are not an exact science. And here is the first thing that I would like to bring your attention to. When you use any team model, you are trying to see how that particular tool, how those explanations could help you propel your team forward. But that is not a prison and that is not the most absolute truth or something that you should dogmatically follow. And that's why there are actually many models and there are actually some models that are applied better in certain circumstances. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Now, here is a disclaimer before we get started. Any team model, can be helpful for you, any. And some are more a negative focus, such as the famous um, Patrick Lencioni model. I'm not gonna be talking about those more negative ones. I'm actually going to be focused in my own way. If you know me already, you know that I'm always about positivity thinking, possibility thinking, and solution focus. So we're gonna be looking at some models that look at things from a more positive light and that cover several different aspects of the development of a team. So. Here we go. The five models we are covering today that help you coach and lead better teams are the Tuckman model, the Robbins and Judge model, the T7 model, the GRPI model, and the Hackman model. The Tuckman model is the one with the famous four stages of team development. And what many people seem to have forgotten is that already many decades ago, a fifth stage was added. And that stage talks about the dissolution of a team as a reminder that any mission sometimes can get outdated or get completed. So you need to talk about and understand what happens after that mission is no longer valid or has already been achieved. In forming, people get to know each other. That's the first stage. There's a lot of the excitement of starting. And then comes stormy where people start to finally work more together, understand the differences on how you do things, I do things, open up, and then, wow, guess what? Conflict starts arising. Norming is then the third stage in which I actually understand that you have your way of doing things, I have my way of doing things, and we can agree on a third way that is better for the collective so that we start winning together. And finally, performing is when the processes are really refined, they are simple, there is a shared motivation to work together, you and I, and the teams actually here start to look more like this one powerful unit. As a coach, why would you care about this model? Well, the first thing that I really like is that this is one of the few models that explains the journey of people working together. So it really just suggests how people can become a team over time. The second way, which is my favorite, is really using the model with the team themselves as either you, you're a new manager, a new coach coming into the team, and then you introduce that tool for them. One, it could be for just a simple conversation for self-diagnosing. Where do we think we are in the five stage model as a team? And then you start discussing what the journey looks like from beginning to end, because you're talking about how we're gonna get to performance and what does it even look like once we are finally done and completed the mission. In a more particular case, you could even use, suppose the team is just starting and you bring that activity and introducing what each and every um, stage is in the model, you could actually Ask your team to proactively think about what are the signs that they will recognize for each and every step and what are the questions that they want to ask themselves and what are the things that they want to pay attention to to make sure that they are transitioned towards performance in a, in a smoother, clearer way. So one example could be, 
how can we storm, disagree and have troubles in a more peaceful and respectful way. And then norming versus performing could be the conversation of, well, how are we going to make sure that we are not just getting very comfortable with where we are at now and in fact, start pushing a little bit more for performance. And finally, I think that both for the leaders and for their teams, this is a model that reminds us all that teams won't reach success overnight. You have to pay attention to the processes and you have to pay attention to interpersonal relationships for getting into team performance. So one mistake is to think that this model is linear, which it isn't. But my personal contribution to the model is actually suggesting you to think about those stages in a spiral. Yes, you go through all these stages a little bit all the time, but imagine that you're really going um, in an evolving manner. You're never going to norm in the same way or storm in the same way based on the fact that team members come in and out and the issues arise and processes change, but you're constantly in an evolution. And I feel like the spiral resolves that a lot better for us. The next model is the Judge and Robbins model. It has four dimensions to it, and they are context, composition, work design, and team process. And it isn't my favorite model, but I really appreciate that it calls out team composition and one of the four elements that you have to pay attention to for successful, effective teams. So context is the fact that the team has a climate of trust, adequate resources, some sort of a performance reward system and effective leadership and structure. Team composition, well, have the right people join the team. That's an easy one. It's about their skills, of course, but also about their personalities and even about their roles. Then you have work design, which giving the right work to the right team composition creates some sort of virtual cycle. And last but not least, team process is the process through which the team achieves its goals, including committing to a common purpose, some sort of self-belief, um, managing conflict, organizing how the desired outcome will be reached, etc., etc., accountability, all that good stuff. I find that this model offers a great opportunity, especially with the team composition piece, a space for you to ask the leaders, well, what kind of team are you dreaming about here? Go into the dream, look into the future. What does this team look like? And allows you to really design the team because yes, you should be designing your teams. Teams are not formed by chance. I find that the best way for using this model is to be asking them the leaders specific questions for each of those four elements in the model. You'd be asking who would be the ideal people to be part of this team? What kind of work would they be doing? What is it that they need to believe as a team in order to be successful? What should they organize themselves around and how? That sort of thing. And then as you can see, or you can imagine, this allows for a more dense and intentional team design. The T7 model gets its name from the initials of the seven elements that it describes, all starting with the letter T. Now, I find seven a big number of elements, but in the context of an effectiveness team model, what I think that you can do with something that big, you know, seven dimensions is that you can construct a very nice spider chart to use as team health as far as a self-assessment for the teams. The model divides five T's as internal factors and then two T's as external factors. So internal factors are more self-explanatory, like trust. It's trust among team members. You know, you got my back, I got yours. Then you have talent as basically the skills to do the job. Then you have thrust, which is what propels us forward, like a common objective or a goal. Then very interesting, they have the task skill, which is separating the skill to do the work versus the ability to do it, which can depend on tools and whatever you have around you. And then you have teaming skills, which is the ability to function as a team. A great call out because not every star person in your company is necessarily a great team worker. So like I mentioned, the first thing I like about this model is that you're able to do a spider chart with those dimensions to look into. But then the next two dimensions, 
that are the external factors I really, really love because it calls out the aspects of leadership and support for the team. So they are team support from the organization, which speaks of how well the organization supports teamwork and even in particular the mission of that team. And then the team leader fit. How cool is that? Huh? Basically, whether the leader works well with their team, which includes effectiveness of that leadership as well as the interpersonal elements of that particular leader. Now, the T7 model is really great because sometimes when you think about teams, we think it's all about them. We think about those five factors that happen inside the team. But the T7 reminds us all that even if you have those five elements in place, if you don't have the other two, which are related to support and leadership, the environment around the team, the success of your team still will be hampered. So if you're interested in using this model with the teams, like I mentioned in some sort of spider chart, I think you could add a few questions per dimension in there, or you could just get each of those seven and help people rate them on a scale of one to 10. And I think what's gonna be nice is that then you're gonna finally see uh, what is happening here. Are people signaling that they, they need more organizational support? Is it actually the, the skill set that is lacking? Or is something related about the fact that the management could be a little bit more effective? I do find this is a pretty humbling model when in use. So the next one is the GRPI model, which is a very well-known team effectiveness model. I think it's very suitable for you to use with teams that are struggling with lack of direction or being unable to hit their goals. It's very good for self-diagnosing and for finding solutions forward. It is simple, you know, each of the letters in the acronym is one of the four dimensions and you have goals, roles, procedures, and interpersonal relationships. And the dimensions mean what the words really mean. So I find that compared to the second model I, I showed you today, the Judge and Robbins model, this one is a lot clearer and simpler to use with your teams. So when you talk about goals, it says that clear objectives and direction are necessary for team effectiveness, for a team to be effective. And then you have in roles that the responsibilities of each team member must be clearly understood and not just by one team member, but by everybody. We must all understand what part do we play together in the team. Then the procedures basically talk about processes and even the system that you were putting in place for the successful operation with, of the team and interpersonal relationships. As you can imagine, every team member must develop relationships with other team members and it is essential that they can trust each other and communicate more effectively. So how could you use that model as a coach? Like I said, it's one of my favorites when people are allegedly not hitting any goals. So you have a very simple and very clear element of four quadrants to try and diagnose the team and even to format the conversation you're gonna be having with the team about performance. You can then see, does the goal, does the mission, is that very clear? Can people recite like that at any given point in time? And well, if they can, Still, how does the work that they do align with what they say is the mission? Is there a disconnection there? Then you can see roles and responsibilities and, and talk about, are there any balls being dropped? Is there anyone that's like, nope, not me, I shouldn't be doing this? Or is everybody chiming in together? So I do find that the questions that you can ask around those four quadrants really help you diagnose quickly where the effectiveness problems seem to be happening for the team in a given time. The final and fifth model, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I love this model. It's called the Hackman model with five elements in it. And I want to call it out because of the fact that I'm so appreciative that it really just talks about the need for expert coaching for team success. So you will have five elements being a real team, enabling structure, compelling direction, access to expert coaching and supportive context. So if I would describe this a little bit, it looks like some of the models that we already saw, but really with a flavor as in 
Do you have access to a mentor and coach when you are in the need? And it also implies that teams have the maturity to understand and really ask for when they, they need that type of help, some coaching to get to the next level on their performance. But how I would use this is very similar to any other model. And if you're interested in a deeper dive, I'll be more than happy to cover the Hackman model in more detail as well. So these are the five models I wanted to share with you. And I just want to end on a note that there are many more that you could use, many more team effectiveness and development models. And you can pick any model of your choice to help your coaching of the team. What I usually do though, is that I ask myself a few questions and usually that's going to guide me through selecting a model that would help in some shape or form. The first is thinking, is this model more appropriate for a leadership conversation or is something that I could use in work sessions with the team? Then I would think, is this model allowing the teams to do some self-gauging towards performance? That's another question you could be asking. Then um, you can ask, does this model at all help me or the team identify dysfunctions and not only identify them, but have a dialogue around them. And I guess finally, you could think, is this a model more suitable for teams in the beginning of their journey together? And, and if so, how can then a model like this be a guidepost for their progress? So at this point, I will obviously plug shamelessly my Agile coaching program here because in there, I really help you understand in way more detail and in practice what it looks like to um, coach for team development because you need to understand both from a team perspective and a coach perspective that coaching teams is not the same as coaching individuals and that individual performance and progress is way less complex than team progress and performance. I always end my videos a little bit curious. So now I have questions for you. Is there one team model here that you found more interesting? Is there one that I didn't mention that is actually your favorite? Or maybe are you noticing a common thread among all of the team models that I offered you here today? So let me know in the comments and I'd love to hear about them. I can, if you want, go into a deeper dive into some of them. So just let me know which and why specifically. But for today, this video ends here and I will catch you on the next one. Bye.